La teoria delle stringhe è un episodio senza precedenti nella storia della fisica moderna. Dopo decine di anni di ricerche, condotte da migliaia di scienziati, le sue predizioni non hanno ancora ricevuto una conferma sperimentale. L'esistenza stessa delle stringhe, gli elementi che stanno alla base della teoria, non è mai stata accertata, poiché le loro minuscole dimensioni non sono rilevabili dagli attuali strumenti. Per questo motivo è aperto da anni un dibattito sulla sua validità scientifica. Uno degli elementi che suscitano perplessità è che questa teoria sia in grado di descrivere l'universo nella sua integrità a partire dallo studio delle particelle elementari e delle loro interazioni. Alcuni studiosi sostengono infatti che, al crescere della complessità del sistema di riferimento, debbano necessariamente entrare in gioco altre leggi fisiche. I sostenitori delle stringhe ammettono che l'universo è troppo complesso per far sì che una sola teoria possa fornire una descrizione globale di tutti i suoi aspetti, ma spiegano che la scoperta di una teoria del tutto segnerebbe solo il punto di inizio. Sarebbe un solido fondamento sul quale costruire una profonda comprensione del mondo. Un'altra caratteristica che attira aspre critiche è la sua eccessiva ricchezza. Si dice che esistano tante teorie delle stringhe, quanti sono i teorici? Negli anni Ottanta si sono sviluppate cinque varianti di quella che dovrebbe essere la teoria del tutto. I fisici si sono accorti infatti che la supersimmetria poteva essere inclusa nella teoria delle stringhe in cinque modi diversi cosa che ha creato non poco imbarazzo all'interno della comunità scientifica. Ricerche più recenti affermano però che le cinque teorie delle superstringhe altro non sono che diversi modi di descrivere una stessa teoria onnicomprensiva, secondo uno schema unificante proposto da Edward Witten con la sua cosiddetta teoria M. In the understanding that emerged after the work of Green and Schwartz, it seemed that there were five fundamental possible string theories. If you wonder why there are five, well, they differ by basic properties of the string. For example, in four of the theories, a string is a little closed loop, a vibrating closed loop of string. In one of them, the string is allowed to have endpoints. In two of the theories, the string conducts electric current and in the other three theories, the string is an electrical insulator. Conceptually, having only five string theories was a big advance over standard quantum theory, where there are infinitely many possible theories, and traditionally, physicists are supposed to find the right theory based on experimental clues. <clears throat> For example, that's how the standard model of elementary particle physics was invented in the 60s and 70s, where the right building blocks, quarks, leptons, photons and so on, and the right fundamental branching rules were discovered based on experimental clues. There were infinitely many possible theories and you're supposed to find the right one. The consistency of string theory is much tighter. Instead of infinitely many possible theories, there were only five, and one of them, the E8 times E8 hydraulic string, looked like a particularly good candidate for describing the real world. Having only five theories, instead of infinitely many, is a big advance, but it leaves you slightly dissatisfied, because why not go all the way? We only live in one universe, not five of them, and if there are five theories, one of which describes us, you're left with the question, well, who lives in the other four worlds? Unlike a lot of big questions in the subject, the question of why there are five string theories and not just one actually has been answered. 
in the period around 1994 and 1995, uh, and this is something I played a little bit of a role in, it was found out that the five string theories are actually different limiting cases of one bigger theory. There's one bigger theory, which we don't understand very well. We've been grappling with it in different ways ever since Veneziano's work of 1968. But there's one bigger theory that has the five traditionally known theories as limiting cases, and it also has got another limiting case that involves something called 11-dimensional supergravity. If you want to know what I mean by a limiting case, you should, roughly speaking, imagine a world with two variables, both of which will be unfamiliar to most of you. One of them is the quantum nature of the universe, measured by Planck's constant, h-bar, and the other is the stringy nature of the universe, measured by what's called alpha prime, that was a fundamental constant in the Veneziano amplitude. So, in a two-dimensional space that measures stringiness and quantumness, the five string theories are different limiting cases, and when that picture was developed at the same time, we acquired a much more comprehensive understanding of the mathematics involved, and we understand that uh, there are many more possibilities and more limiting situations to explore, far beyond what we imagined in the past. When string theory had gone into eclipse in the mid-70s, well, one reason was that it didn't seem needed, and then there were the two things people didn't like, the extra massless particles and the extra dimensions. Well, the the fact that it didn't seem needed was dealt with by finding a new mission for the theory, which was to describe not the strongly interacting world, but everything, including Einstein's general relativity, the quantum theory of gravity, and all the elementary particles. And for that, the massless particles that had seemed troublesome were needed. They were the quantum unit of Einstein's gravity. But finally, the extra dimensions were also needed to unify all of the elementary particles with everything else to have room to describe the richness of the elementary particles as different states of one vibrating string. It turns out that if the string just vibrates in the known dimensions, that's not quite enough. You need the extra vibrational freedom of the string to vibrate in hidden dimensions to give it the richness to describe not just gravity and electromagnetism, but also different kinds of quarks and leptons, neutrinos, W bosons, and all of the surprising things that have been discovered in particle accelerators over the decades. So ultimately, extra dimensions were understood as a blessing in disguise. The period following the unification of the string theories in the mid-90s was one when the perspectives of string theorists about what the topic meant are much broader. And as a result, a lot of things have been discovered that would have been hard to imagine beforehand. Certainly, though, the most fundamental of these is the discovery by my colleague Juan Malvasena here at the Institute for Advanced Studies of a fundamental duality, as we call it, between quantum gravity, which, remember, is the hardest thing in physics to try to understand, and a conventional theory without gravity. The picture is a little bit like a hologram. An ordinary photograph captures a picture of three-dimensional reality in two dimensions, but it loses some information. You can't see the perspective of the three-dimensional scene properly from a two-dimensional projection. A hologram is a more sophisticated way to capture a three-dimensional reality in two dimensions, and from a hologram, you can reconstruct the spatial relations in three dimensions, but the cost is that the information is stored in the two-dimensional sheet in a way that isn't intuitively obvious at a glance. You, know how to, you need to know how to read the hologram. Well, Montesano discovered something similar for gravity, that a world like the one we live in, that has gravitational forces in it, as well as quantum mechanics, and there are three space dimensions plus time, is actually equivalent to a different description with only two spatial dimensions plus time, which captures a holographic image of our reality in a theory that's a more conventional type of quantum theory without gravity. 
So there are two descriptions. There's the one that we experience in everyday life, three space dimensions and gravitational forces that hold us down to Earth and keep the Earth moving around the Sun. There's a holographic description, one dimension less, no gravity, standard quantum theory of the type that is difficult. It's what physicists have grappled with since 1930. Durante il congresso Strings 1995, Edward Witten stupisce i presenti annunciando di aver trovato una soluzione al problema di sovrabbondanza che affliggeva la teoria delle stringhe. Presenta infatti uno schema onnicomprensivo nel quale confluiscono e si fondono le diverse teorie emerse dagli studi degli anni Ottanta, che fino ad allora erano considerate del tutto disgiunte una dall'altra. Questo schema unitario viene denominato teoria M. Quale sia il preciso significato della lettera M non è noto. Lo stesso Witten dice che potrebbe essere membrana, matrice o madre, nel senso di madre di tutte le teorie. Sebbene siano ancora molti gli aspetti oscuri, due caratteristiche fondamentali della teoria sono già state identificate. La prima è che le stringhe descritte possono vibrare in 11 dimensioni spazio-temporali e la seconda è che in essa è prevista l'esistenza di altri minuscoli elementi, come membrane bidimensionali o masserelle tridimensionali oscillanti. La natura più completa della teoria rimane comunque in gran parte sconosciuta, tanto che qualcuno sostiene che il significato della lettera M sia proprio mistero. Nonostante le difficoltà, i teorici delle stringhe sono convinti che essa possa costituire il passo fondamentale nella ricerca della teoria del tutto, quella capace di riunire in una descrizione coerente l'insieme dei fenomeni naturali. Come ha osservato lo stesso Witten, capire cosa sia realmente la teoria M modificherebbe la nostra comprensione della natura in maniera non meno radicale di quanto abbiano fatto le grandi rivoluzioni scientifiche del passato. Questa potrebbe essere la nuova frontiera della fisica del ventunesimo secolo.